Thank you. How kind. It is a definite honor and privilege to be here and to be asked to talk about my favorite thing in the whole world, which is research with music therapy in infants in medical settings. I started out as a young person getting a degree in music therapy many years ago and was very interested in children with disabilities and how music could help those children learn. As I progressed in my career, I noted the importance of early intervention. Why let problems get worse if you could intervene sooner and prevent some of those problems and maximize learning earlier on. And as I worked with small children and toddlers and then infants and began focusing research on infant learning, I discovered most of the babies I was working with that were having learning problems had started out as premature babies in the hospital. So I migrated into the medical setting for infant learning thinking about how much neurological development occurs while that baby is undergoing medical treatment and how could music be used beneficially to the future of those children. So that's what I've been doing for about the last 20 years. I have a specialty in medical music therapy overall. I started the program at TMH, which is now three clinical music therapists with an internship and practica sites for our students that are separate, uh, supervised in the hospital. We developed the institute which trains internationally music therapists and medical personnel in how to use music in a medical setting and to enhance medical treatment and prevent problems especially with children. Medical treatment is traumatizing for children because they don't understand it and therefore you get all sorts of side effects that need to be dealt with and music is a wonderful way to do that. So I'm going to pull together some of all of that research but really focus on infant learning this morning. And my latest series of studies has been looking at fetal brain development after the baby's born in the hospital. So music therapy always starts with what is the problem that you're trying to solve as you think about what the research uh, benefits might be from using music. So let's talk about the problem of prematurity for a minute. Here are some definitions for you. Prematurity is increasing in the United States. We have uh, so many babies that are born very low birth weight or very early on in life and they are treated in the neonatal intensive care unit. So you'll hear me use the NICU acronym a good deal. We train people internationally in how to use music therapy in the NICU because the population is so specialized and so fragile that um, we think that there are a lot of precautions you have to know about before you decide to go in and start adding music to this environment. So our NICU in Tallahassee is a level four. Children are helicoptered in from a large regional area if they need the more intensive care and then they are moved closer to home as they progress and they move down in level for highly specialized care. So when I talk about prematurity, remember that a term infant is 38 to 40 gestational weeks. That's a nine month baby. I'm going to be talking about babies that begin at 23 weeks and survive. That is an entire trimester early, an entire three months early. Needless to say, the neurological system is not completed. The neurological system of the fetus develops in the final trimester. So in essence, this baby is now in the hospital, outside the womb, being given life-sustaining medical treatment while the neurological system is trying to wire and to develop. Needless to say, there will be problems with this. Survivability at 23 gestational weeks is only 50%, but it goes up tremendously with just one more month of growth. By 27 or 28 percent, the great um, 27 or 28 gestational weeks, the great percentage of babies will survive, but they may have lifelong disabilities as a result of faulty neurological wiring. By faulty wiring, I mean the situation that they're in is so traumatic for them, it saves their life, but the neurological system cannot wire in the normal way that it would were they still in the womb. So you can see there's an increased need for special education. The motor problems that are labeled cerebral palsy are a common one, but the, the next most common problem for premature babies is attention deficit disorder. 
at the beginning of life they may have open heart surgery, they might have gastrointestinal surgery because the uh, digestive system is too immature to process any kind of food so they have to disconnect it and let the baby get a little bit older and reconnect it. So there are surgeries and IV lines and other types of uh, oxygen provision, medical treatment that are necessary but the baby uh, is having difficulty with the pain, has very high levels of stress hormones in their body, and all of those things are affecting the neurological system. So the brain is wiring in escape format. It's wiring in hyperactive format. It's wiring in hypersensitivity format. And those may be future problems for the baby unless there's something that we could do about that. Um, did that skip one? No, sorry. Okay. Um, I put this together as a demonstration of the level of problem that we're talking about. The upper left-hand photo is a typical baby on the first day of life being held by his older brother. Everyone go, ah, because those are my grandchildren, <laughs> which is how I got the picture. And my daughter said, you didn't ask my permission if you could use that picture. But on the first day of life, this baby is nurtured, it's held, it rooms in, in the hospital room, in most hospitals, with the mother. It's, all of the family comes to visit. This baby is being touched and felt. The baby is fed when it's hungry as opposed to holding a feeding because there's going to be surgery later today and there can't be anything in the baby's stomach. So no matter how much it cries in the medical setting, it may not get fed. And the other pictures are a contrast of what it's like for the premature baby. So if you start at the upper part in the middle, if this baby is born very prematurely, it's going to be connected to life-sustaining equipment. And it's going to be stabilized so that the arms and limbs cannot move to pull out the IV lines or to pull at the tubes that are giving that. So you can see that the baby's ability to interact in the environment is highly restricted, let alone the oxygen that is coming through the ventilator that is pushing the lungs to function, or the pain that might be coming from an IV line. As the baby progresses, and it will stay in the NICU until its due date, so if the baby's born three months premature, it's going to get medical treatment for three months before it can go home from the hospital. The progression goes around to the other picture in the upper part, and you can see now the baby is not in the open, it's in an isolate, but it doesn't have clothes yet. The skin is too sensitive to put material on. The isolate is heated to maintain the baby's body temperature because the brain is not sophisticated enough to maintain body temperature. And then the child gets to a mechanism that uh, just provides some extra room air, not oxygen, which is better for their vision. And then the bottom picture is the babies are getting just about ready to go home. They are still much smaller when they are discharged at our hospital. When they weigh about four and a half pounds, they're allowed to go home. You saw on an earlier slide an average baby born in the United States at term weighs seven and a half pounds. So the baby's been in the hospital three months. It's about half the size of a term infant. Chronologically, it's three months old but it's functioning like a newborn because it's just now neurologically got to that point. So there will be developmental delay by definition of the chronological birth being a little too early in the fetal development of the baby. And the open crib where the baby is actually using the PAL, we're going to be talking about the pacifier, where the baby is simply swaddled and body heat is maintained through blankets, that baby is ready for discharge and will be going home. However, they tell you keep the baby at home for about six months, don't go out into the environment because there are germs, bacteria, and viruses. The baby's lungs have been immature, they're very fragile, and hopefully you don't want this baby to get pneumonia or any lung bacteria that would threaten its life after discharge. So most babies just stay at home with their mom the first six months after discharge. And I'm going to end up today talking about the outpatient program that we do for developmental milestones to help prevent some of the problems with these babies. So within the last six months, uh, neonatolo neonatologists, the physicians in the NICU, are calling for brain care treatment. They have 
identified all of the medical treatments that save the baby's life. They have also identified how damaging this can be to the neurological system. And they're beginning to say, isn't there something we could do to prevent the damage or add a therapy for the kind of wiring that would be long-term benefit to the child for learning purposes? Could we, in essence, start early intervention in the NICU? That's what I've been doing 20 years of research on. I've been waiting for a physician to ask that question. Do I have some answers for you that I would like to give you about that? I think that music therapy is the perfect therapy in, in both of those settings. So here are some facts about the third trimester. If we assume this baby's been born very early, is going to spend the third trimester in the NICU, what is happening with their neurological system? There is a great deal of plasticity, the neurological term for brand new brain cells, 250,000 a minute. Think about that. If I have five minutes of pain, or 15 minutes of pain, or an hour of pain, think about how many brain cells have been wired going, ow, oh, get me out of here, as we say a hyper alert state. As opposed to, I am just comfortable and serene, there are no stress hormones in my body, and I am sleeping for that hour when brain cells are growing and dividing and wiring in a normally functioning way for that baby. The neural cells compete with each other so that you use the term um, newborns are self-constructing. So here's brain material looking for a function. Cells are growing and they have to move out on a glial to the area of the brain that they are designed to function in. So if it's a vision cell, it has to move to the vision area of the brain. If it's an auditory cell or a motor cell, each one moves along the glial. When it gets there, it just sits there and waits for a function. So if an auditory cell gets there and there's a loud sound, that auditory cell hooks up and responds, moving muscles or a startle reflex to, oh, you surprised me or scared me. So if the only sounds you're hearing are the sounds that produce hypersensitive startles or produce irritation or annoyance or produce like the background noises of the ventilator going all the time that you can't get away from. You would just like to quietly go to sleep, but there's some mechanical noise in the background that is affecting you. That's the wiring you're going to get. So this premature infant's brain is constructing in a mode in response to the medical setting. So everyone says, and all the research shows, the earlier you can discharge the baby to home, the better for the baby. Home is a nurturing environment where people do not stick needles into you. Home feeds you when you're hungry and you cry. Home turns the lights out at night and you don't get visual stimulation from the lights being turned on to provide medical treatment or diapering in the middle of the night. Therefore, the brain now can begin to wire in normal mode. But could we shift some of that normalcy to the NICU environment? We also know that the brain is going to wire from the head down to the feet and from the center of the body out. So you know babies can sit up and maintain their trunk and head before they can stand up and maintain their balance. And we are going to use that fact to look at what's developmentally appropriate for a very young uh, infant. So a 28 gestational week infant, if you touch them on the top of the head, can be very accepting. The neurological system is mature enough to say that touch is okay. It actually feels good. It's called massage. You're stroking me as in affection. I'm getting pleasure. But you touch my feet, that hasn't wired yet. My feet jerk out and give you a hypersensitive response. It's a direct indication the neurological system is not ready for the feet to be touched. So in handling the baby, we need to be aware, what's the gestational age of this child? What is the gestational checklist for development across gestational weeks? And you talk about weeks, not months of age. So a 35 gestational week baby is very different from a 34 gestational week baby because wiring and maturation are happening very, very quickly at this fetal level. Remember, 250,000 neurons a minute. So we're going to incorporate all of those issues. And what do we look at, what do we look for in terms of neurologic maturation? How do we know that the brain is wiring in a way that's going to benefit learning in the future for the baby? 
when the brain matures, it can habituate to stimuli. So if the skin receptors are immature and you touch the baby's skin, the hand gives a primitive startle response. It will be a huge motor jerking away from that stimulus. That's a sign of neurologic immaturity. If I can touch the skin and the brain tolerates that touch, it has habituated. The brain doesn't need to respond. It identifies that touch. There is awareness of the touch. And so we're going to move from overly responsive because the brain isn't ready yet to tolerance or habituation to noise and light and touch and language. And then we're going to move to focused attention to a stimulus. Not only do I accept that stimulus repeatedly, but if you move it, I focus my attention as the stimulus moves. So if sound is over here, I turn my head toward it to say, oh, it's there. I'm aware and tracking or focusing the attention as the stimulus moves from one side of my body to another. So you can track visual stimuli and they actually test the babies before they go home. Can you see this red ball that I'm holding up? And if I move it, do your eyes follow it? Your brain has developed enough to find the ball and focus attention across movement to be able to continue looking at that ball. Now, if the baby stays in overstimulation, brain cells quit dividing every time it's overstimulated, which is some of the faulty wiring that's happening and some of the problem that's happening with neurological development. And later on, if we see this in an older child, we call it hyperactivity and attention deficit disorder that every new stimulus causes the child to look around and try to focus and they can't sustain attention. If they're sitting in here listening to me talk, any noise in the hallway would be distracting and they would begin to focus on that immediately and not be able to shut that out and focus on what is happening in this immediate environment. So because the brain matures, Neurologically, you have the capability as highly sophisticated learners in college to sit quietly for an hour and listen to a lecture. You might even fall asleep if you get really comfortable. So the outcome of all of this is 50% of children are going to need special ed and it, as they grow up. They have identified the most uh, severely premature, the babies born earliest, can have one-third less brain volume when they reach school age. One-third less brain volume than a child their same chronological age. And it's not that the brain is smaller, it's a normally sized brain, but it has holes in it, like Swiss cheese. Areas of brain tissue that did not develop because of interruption or faulty wiring going on for that first three months of life. We would think that would be wonderful if we could prevent that and that's what neonatologists are calling for at this point. So music therapy is the function of using music to solve a problem, to solve a health problem, to solve an education.